Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the civil service examination's perspective. So today, we will be taking up certain important topics from The Hindu as well as Indian Express, Delhi edition, dated 16th October 2023. You can see on your screen, this is the topic list. These topics we will be covering from the PLIMS perspective and certain topics we will be covering from the mains perspective, having multiple dimensions associated with that topic. So the names of the topic, for example, in prelims, which we are going to cover is the Goa Cashew in the context of GI tag, Kaziranga Sanctuary, Baba Banda Singh Bahadur. Certainly in newspapers, we do not get such sections from the history. So that is why we have taken this topic also. It was there in the Hindu newspaper today. RCEP as well as a map based question. <clears throat> from the main perspective, we will be taking up certain questions certain topics in the relation of water stress as well as conservation and from disaster management we will be taking the glacial lake outburst floods which in short form is also known as GLOFs. So these are certain topics which we will be taking up today. So the first topic <coughs> is in the relation of the GI tag recently been accorded to the cashew, a form of cashew which is grown in the state of Goa. And this is the very immediate context of this news article that recently the Goa cashew, which is also known as the kernel, has got a GI tag. So we will be covering this topic in the form of a practice questions as well as certain key facts related to this particular topic. If you go by the previous year question paper analysis, you will see that questions related to crops have been asked multiple times. For example, in 2019, the question was asked that which one of the following groups of plants was domesticated in the new world and introduced into the old world. Now we all know that many a times directly questions have been asked from the GI tag section. But what this question tells us that we need to be aware about the historical perspective and some other dimensions also associated with any crop. So we will be taking up this practice questions once we are done with this topic. So let us discuss the cashews in India in this context. The first and the foremost important historical perspective, historical information is that this cashew was a native of northeast Brazil and was introduced to Goa. That means it is not native to India, right? So cashews was in Brazil and they were introduced to Goa by Portuguese and their objective to introduction was afforestation as well as the soil conservation. But now, despite the fact that this is not a native crop of India, India is one of the largest cashew exporter accounting for almost 15% of the world's export share. Right. So, it was not native but still because we grew it so much that we became one of the largest exporter. As far as the growing conditions of this particular crop is concerned, it is a tropical crop. That is why it was successfully introduced in Goa in India because it has a tropical humid climate. So that is why all the climatic conditions which you can, uh, which you can know about the tropical part will be relevant for the growth of cashew. For example, the temperature which is required for the growth of this cashew is around 20 to 35 degrees Celsius. The most suitable temperature can also go up to 38 degrees Celsius. As far as the rainfall is concerned, around 1000 to 2000 mm rainfall, that is 100 to 200 centimeter, is required annually. <laughs> as far as the relative humidity is concerned, again because it is a tropical humid climate, so obviously relative humidity will also be on a higher side and hence Relative humidity is around 60 to 90 percent. However, important point is that excess of humidity, very large humidity can be detrimental also for this crop because it may promote the fungal disease in this crop, right? And last is the well-drained soil is required for the growth of cashew in India. The soils can be multi of multiple variety, but an important aspect is that there should be a proper drainage, there should not be a waterlogged condition for this, right? So these are certain important growing conditions. Further, 
they are sensitive to cold and frost so that is why obviously they cannot be grown in those areas which are having colder climate also if in those areas because of climate change we experience a climatic or thermal anomaly that that particular region is experiencing below average temperature that might also be detrimental for the growth of this crop right so now let us see the practice question because these topics are just from the plinth's perspective so obviously not much analysis but yes key facts related to this topic is important so let us see with reference to the cashew tree consider the following statements so there are three statements given and as the trend goes that you have to find that how many statements given above are correct so the first statement says it was introduced in india from the new world countries now brazil is one of the new world countries and hence this statement is correct right actually new world countries refer to the group of countries for example north america south america etc and the old world countries are like asian countries african countries okay the second statement says that cashew trees are xerophytic vegetation now xerophytic vegetation is basically the desert vegetation those crops which are grown in semi arid or the arid areas but we know that cashews are grown where tropical humid climate and therefore this statement is incorrect the second is incorrect third says that cashew grows suitable in temperature range of 20 to 38 degrees celsius we just learned about it that the tropical warm climate is beneficial for this and the temperature range is between 20 to 38 degrees celsius it was just a factual information we looked over here and that is why this statement is also correct so second is incorrect one and three that is two statements are correct and hence option b that is only two will be the correct answer as far as the answer of the previous year question is concerned it is option a right so now let us move to the next topic the next topic is in relation to the kazi ranga sanctuary again when you come to the prelims examination especially in the environment as well as the ecology section almost every year one to two questions are related to the national parks wildlife sanctuary etc that is the protected areas because protected areas form one of the most important conservation strategy when it comes to the indian environmental policies right so that is why their location the flora and fauna associated with it and other physiographic features which are related to these national parks or wildlife sanctuaries becomes important the immediate context in which this topic has appeared in today's newspaper is that recently the kaziranga national park which is also a tiger reserve was reopened and with a literary tribute to british forest officer patrick d stracy and there was also an inauguration of the centenary convention center in his name right so because of this this topic has appeared in news however this context is not very important but yes important facts related to this kaziranga national park or sanctuary or tiger reserve is very important again going by the previous year question paper analysis if you see that upsc asked a prelims question in the year 2020 we have taken it just for a reference every year questions are asked from this theme so in 2020 the question was asked in relation to india's desert national park so give yourself a try okay and you try to attempt this particular question there were three statements given related to the location related to some important feature as well as related to the fauna species and you were to find the correct answer out of the given pair we will come to this practice question once we are done we have understood the key facts related to this kaziranga sanctuary right so first kaziranga national park and tiger reserve if you closely see this map you will see that on the northern part of this kaziranga national park we have a river brahmaputra as well as eastern part that is the northeastern part is also bordered by which river that is brahmaputra so that means river brahmaputra is in the north as well as towards certain portion of the east right let us see the facts one very important fact from the historical perspective related to this is that it was formed on the recommendation of who 
it was mary curzon now who is mary curzon mary curzon was a wife of lord curzon who was viceroy of india right so it was formed in 1908 on the recommendation of mary curzon wife of lord curzon as far as the present political units are concerned two important districts of assam that is golaghat and nagaon districts are there in which this national park is located also in 1985 it was declared as a world heritage site now this fact is very important which body declares the world heritage site it is unesco right so the world heritage sites are also from the cultural perspective they are also from the environment that is natural sites natural perspective and therefore this kaziranga national park was declared as a world heritage site right now as far as the important rivers related to this is concerned we have discussed that brahmaputra river forms the northern as well as the eastern boundaries now there are certain small local rivers also which are important for example mora diflu is a river which forms the southern boundary and other rivers which are in this park is the diflu as well as mora dhansari right so dhansari is a major river a broad a big river and its certain small tributaries is the mora dhansari in this particular area now when we have to discuss about important species the most important species which is present in this national park is the one horned rhino right so indian one horned rhinoceros is present over there and if we have to compare this with the global population distributed across different countries around 2/3 of the global world population of this is there in the kaziranga national park right further there are other important species like elephants wild water buffalo swamp deer hullock gibbon this species is also important right tiger leopard etc they are also present but most important is indian one horned rhino as well as hullock gibbon factual information you have to memorize this right it is also recognized as the important bird area now again an important fact important bird area is declared by which organization it is bird life international basically it is a ngo civil society organization so bird life international declares any particular area which is important for the bird species from the ecological perspective and this kaziranga national park is an important bird area as far as the natural vegetation is concerned so because there is variation in the altitude and we know as the altitude varies the climate also varies so climatic parameters varies and because there will be a variation in the climatic parameters hence there will be variation in the natural vegetation also right so in this particular area we find alluvial inundated grasslands alluvial savanna woodlands tropical moist mixed deciduous forest as well as tropical semi evergreen forest that means natural vegetation in this particular area ranges from semi evergreen forest to the grasslands we all know that grasslands are the ecotonal areas right so they are the transitional ecosystems between the arid that is desert ecosystems and between the evergreen humid ecosystems so these are certain key facts related to the kaziranga sanctuary national park now let us try to solve the practice question it says that with reference to the kaziranga national park consider the following statements one it is spread over two districts so yes it is spread over two districts and if you feel that upsc does not ask question like this so if you see this question also the first statement was similar that is why we have framed question in this manner but does this make uh, does this make it important that you have to remember that in every national park or wildlife sanctuary how many districts are there no obviously it is not humanly possible also but because there was a question so we framed our today's question in such manner right so yes this statement is correct second statement says that the brahmaputra river now this statement is very important read this carefully the brahmaputra river flows through the middle of the park dividing it into two halves 
सो इज दिस स्टेटमेंट करेक्ट और इन करेक्ट इफ यू रिमेंबर दिस मैप द ब्रह्मपुत्रा रिवर वॉज मेकिंग द नॉर्दर्न बाउंड्री एंड द ईस्टर्न बाउंड्री राइट दैट मीन्स इट इज नॉट फ्लोइंग इन बिटवीन दिस पार्क डिवाइडिंग इट इन टू टू हाफ दैट इज वाई दिट स्टेटमेंट सेकेंड इज इन करेक्ट करेक्ट The third statement says that the park holds the tag of the World Heritage Site declared by UNESCO. We just read about it. Just a factual statement. So yes, this is correct. And therefore, one and three, two statements are correct. So you have to find how many of the above statements are correct. B, only two will be the correct answer. Right. Now moving on to our next topic. Now this topic is from the medieval history section, related to the an important figure. which has not only contributed to the sikh history but has also contributed to the indian history in shaping it in the medieval times he has retaliated many attacks from the foreign land and the name of that personality is baba banda singh bahadur in today's newspaper however there is no article or the piece of information which is uh, uh, which is present over there but there is a small advertisement given in the hindu delhi edition okay and this advertisement is in the context that our prime minister that is of india paid a tribute to sikh warrior baba banda singh bahadur on 350th birth anniversary so because of which this has appeared in today's newspaper so we thought to take it in today's dns session also right again if you go by the previous year questions you will see Yes, there was a time when there was a very low weightage of medieval history questions in the prelim examination. But if you see, for last three to four years, the question have been asked from the medieval history also, and a good portion, a good share have been asked. For example, <clears throat> in twenty twenty one, the question was asked that with reference to the Indian history, which of the following statements is are correct? So there were three statements given. The first was in relation to the Nizamat of Arcot. the second was in relation to the mysore kingdom and the vijayanagar empire and the third was in relation to the rohilkhand kingdom right so try to attempt this question on your own in similar line we will be taking up this practice question also but before taking the practice question it is very logical that first we will go to the important facts related to the topic that is the baba banda singh bahadur again early life the original name of Banda Singh Bahadur was Lachman Dev. Important. If you remember, there was a question which was asked related to Tanzan and his other names, right? So Lachman Dev was uh, the original name of Baba Banda Singh Bahadur, and he was emerged and he emerged as the commander of the Khalsa army. Second important thing is that he was during the Guru Gobind Singh times, and Guru Gobind Singh ji bestowed upon him the name Guru Baksh Singh. again an important fact right as far as the establishment of the khalsa rule is concerned the contribution of baba banda singh bahadur in the administrative aspect is also very important not just the military aspect administrative aspect also he abolished the oppressive zamindari system again important property rights were granted to the tillers of the land right and he introduced the nanak shahi coins he also started his own currency now this is also very important right certain important battles which are related to him is the battle of sonipat which was fought against moguls then is the battle of samana in both the battles he was victorious right as far as the capital of banda singh bahadur is concerned he appointed mukhlisgarh as his capital and this was renamed as lohgarh which further meant the fortress of steel right again i am telling you that these are just the factual informations but yes the topics at least which are coming in newspapers from the history we generally do not happen we can remember those topics na because it has come in the newspaper so that is why just the important facts related to banda singh bahadur now come to the uh, his last days that is the persecution and the mughal response in 1716 during the reign of which emperor again this is very important mughal emperor farukh shiar banda singh bahadur along with his 700 people were executed in delhi during whose reign farukh shiar this event was also witnessed by a european 
visitor an east indian company diplomat because that was the time when east indian company was trying to gain a strong foothold in indian territories right so these are certain important key facts related to baba banda singh bahadur now let us look at the practice question with reference to the history of india consider the following statements there are two statements given and you have to find that which of the above statements are correct during the reign of mughal emperor bahadur shah a sikh leader banda singh bahadur was executed again very simple this is incorrect who was he it was farooq shear right second statements in the battle of samana banda bahadur was defeated by the mughal emperor farooq shear no it was not the battle of Sah samana here if you remember we talked about two important battles battle of sonipat as well as battle of samana and i told you that in both the battles banda singh bahadur was victorious hence he was not defeated again this is also incorrect so what will be the correct answer option d that is neither one nor two right moving on to next films topic again this topic is in the relation of rcep that is regional comprehensive economic partnership you all must be knowing the fact that india chose to remain out of this regional trade grouping right india is not the part of this but still it becomes important why it becomes important because upsc in its main syllabus in general studies main paper 2 also mentions regional groupings affecting the indian interest right so yes this is a regional grouping and yes it does affect the indian interest for example the context in which this article has appeared is that sri lanka which is an very important neighborhood of india has recently applied to join the rcep so it is very obvious that if sri lanka is moving towards this grouping or for that matter any country which is our neighbor which with which we want to establish very good relations if they are moving towards rcep which is dominated by china which in which india is not there so obviously it will affect the indian interest again as far as the rcep is concerned this regional trade block also gains its significance because if you see that in which region this group is formed this is formed in the indo pacific region and in today's geopolitical strategy the indo pacific region the significance of this particular region is has gained multiple times has increased multiple times because this is the region where there are very strong interest of china us as well as india right also here lies other important countries like japan australia south korea as well as north korea because it has an important stake when it comes to the peace and security so that is why this group becomes important but yes we all know that why india was not uh, india chose to remain out this out of this group was because the policies on which this group was formed that was not beneficial for india for example if there has to be relaxation in the tariffs so india felt that if we have to reduce our tariffs with these countries which are dependent on their exports to india that is india is the importer of various products from these very countries and further if india will reduce its tariff that means indian market will be flooded by the products of these countries so it will be detrimental for the domestic industry also right so because because of such reasons india chose to remain out of this block right and therefore today we are not dealing this topic from the mains perspective we are dealing it from the prelims perspective in 2016 the question has already been asked in relation to the rcep it said that the term rcep often appears in the news in the context of the affairs of a group of countries known as which group indo pacific region g20 is it related to it no sco no sarc no asean right association of southeast asian nations so b was the correct answer right practice question today is also just have a look at this question consider the following statements about the most favored nation status principle of wto's general agreement on trade and tariffs now this question has been framed in the context of rcep let us see there are two statements given the first statement says that 
this principle that is the most favored nation principle prohibits the member countries to give special tariff treatments to any member nations over others yes to ensure free and equitable trade this is correct second statement says rcep agreements violated this mfn principle of gatt now we just discussed according to mfn principle no priority can be accorded to any particular country right but in rcep we also discussed that the uh, countries are agreeing in themselves that they will, they will be reducing the tariff barriers so obviously this reduction of tariff barriers will be applicable to whom only to those member countries only to those countries which are member of this group right not to any other country so it might seem that it goes against the principle of mfn but wto's agreement provides an exception for such regional trade groupings and therefore it does not violate the principle of mfn right therefore this statement is incorrect and a only one will be the correct answer right now coming to the next a last prelims oriented topic which is basically a map based topic this article has appeared in the text and context page of the hindu delhi edition and is in relation to the high tea the immediate context is that recently un security council has approved to send a peace mission to protect the country which is facing a gang war and therefore in order to ensure peace the unsc has sent the peace mission led by kenya to this region right so from the perspective uh, from the map location based perspective we will be dealing it again if you go by the previous year questions you will see that in 2018 and almost every year questions are asked if from the global map locations okay so try to attempt so they are the regions mentioned in the news and the corresponding uh, countries so you have to find that this region belongs to which of these countries and you have to identify the correct pairs so try to attempt it right just a factual question right we will be dealing this practice questions first let us look at the map so where is this region haiti located haiti is basically located in the atlantic ocean right this atlantic ocean near the caribbean sea right so if you see this particular map this is the united states region right and uh, this is the south america this is central america this is caribbean sea and here lies the haiti right if you see this there are important other physiographic features for example windward passage is there right also a jamaica channel is there right now let us look at certain uh, that practice question yes in important thing was also their cordillera central important physiographic feature is in dominion republic right noise mountains is in this haiti okay practice question so the regions mentioned in the news their corresponding country on the similar format of upsc let us try first is port au prince now this is the capital of haiti right and here it is mentioned lebanon so obviously this is incorrect herat yes it is there in afghanistan right nairobi we all know is in kenya but here it is mentioned venezuela so this is also incorrect so b that is too early will be the correct answer again a factual information related to this just a map based location right so these were the topics which we dealt from the prince perspective covering all the important facts related to it as well as the previous year questions and the practice questions related to this right now let us move to the analytical part that is the topic from the mains perspective now today from the environmental aspect is a very important day because today is a world food day right why this is important because the theme of this world food day this year is related to water water conservation and water management right the theme says water is life and water is food right that is why 
this topic has appeared in the form of lead articles in both the newspaper now this is from this the hindu newspaper and this is from indian express newspaper both the newspapers have covered the central theme of the relevance of the water the water stress water conservation water management why because of this important day also in this very context important organizations like fao food agriculture organization ifad as well as wfp these organizations have said that presently we are facing one of the gravest threats when it comes to the food and water security they have said that because of the climate change the water scarcity the water stress levels are increasing across the globe not only in india across the globe yes different regions have been hampered in different intensity that is true but almost every region is affected by this issue so that is why this topic becomes important also if you see previous year questions in mains every year the question is asked in relation to the water even in 2023 prelims also the question was asked in relation to the fresh water resources in 2020 the question was asked that how will the melting of himalayan glaciers have a far reaching impact on the water resources of india right 2019 what is water stress that is concept how and why does it differ regionally in india similarly 2018 the ideal solution of the depleting groundwater resources groundwater again an important component of water in india is water harvesting system how can it be made effective in the urban areas so yes dimensions may differ but this theme is very important and every year question is asked mainly in general studies mains paper 1 right so that is why it's important why because general studies mains paper 1 also mentions the changes in the critical geographical features as its important component so because water is changing its characteristic on account of different factors this theme becomes important in here in the context we read about that fao ifad and wfp they are saying that because of climate change there is a issue related to water in different regions right so let us look at it this map shows you that by 2040 which are those regions which will be most affected so if you see that extremely high that the regions which are most affected will be obviously this particular region this region is also the second most highly vulnerable right so this map will help you to identify those areas which are going to face extreme water crises in the coming period on account of the mainly on account of the climate change now can you relate that if any particular region is facing an issue related to water then obviously that particular region will also be facing an issue related to food so the regions which experience water crisis will eventually feel the issue or experience the issue related to food crisis right as far as the climate change is concerned just have a look at these graphs climate change and water how climate change is affecting different forms of water in different regions now this map shows you that because of the climate change there is an increase in the sea level right so this graph is showing you basically increase in the mean sea level and you can see that there is a continuous increase in the sea level because of the climate change right similarly if you see this particular graph it is decreasing but what is it related to it is related to the mass of antarctica so that means on account of climate change if the mass of antarctica is reducing that means the ice is reducing if ice is reducing that means that melting is increasing if melting is increasing that means the water is going to the oceans to the seas which earlier was frozen right these are the impacts of climate change in different forms of water in different regions similarly if we have to talk about the thermal characteristics of water this is also showing an increasing trend if you see since 1980s till 2020 and now also there is an increase in the temperature conditions of in different regions of the water bodies so that means 
the thermal pollution that is the temperature is also increasing and also this becomes very important why now let us imagine that this is the cross section of let us say ocean we all know that this top layer of this ocean experiences insulation right and this bottom layer remains cold you all must be knowing the thermohaline the concept of thermohaline right and so this is somewhat like this so temperature here is the highest and almost constant in the topmost layer then there is a gradual reduction a steep then there is a steep reduction actually and then in the bottom layers of the ocean it is again constant but colder one right for intermixing of water there must be a some sort of thermal homogeneity for example if there is a stark difference between the temperature of the top layer and the bottom layers right that the bottom layers are excessively cold and the top layers are excessively hot that means there will also be a stark difference of density is it true if there will be a stark difference in density then the water from the bottom layers as well as from the top layers will not intermix if the water is not intermixing that means relatively stable water conditions are existing over that particular area is it okay if the water is getting stable in any particular region whether it is the horizontal extent or the vertical extent it will invite ocean acidification right so can i say that climate change is also leading to the ocean acidification because this is what this particular graph shows this graph is related to the ocean ph value and we all know from basic sciences that lower the ph value higher the acidity so it is getting reduced that means acidity is getting increased also dissolved carbon dioxide is also increasing in the water body so point is that how climate change is impacting different water bodies in different regions it is in terms of acidification it is also in terms of carbon dioxide content it is also in terms of rising sea level right and the other impacts which we have discussed now moving to the important multiple dimensions associated with the water right those of you who want to take the screenshot they can take screenshot also right so we will be discussing the important concepts and important dimensions associated with the water first water stress in india if we have to talk about the water stress in india which are those factors which are contributing to this stress just think about it the first and the foremost factor is the uneven distribution of water resources when it come to india okay so let us see that if this is the broad map of india we will see that how there is a stark regional variation in terms of availability of water resources in different aspects for example this region that is the interior deccan that is the uh, leeward side of the western ghats right this region is semi arid and face one of the gravest threats of water availability similarly this region also that is the rajasthan more prominently the western rajasthan face the issue of uh, related to the water availability right but when we come to the areas for example the gangetic plains there is also a issue of water scarcity but yes we know that there are lot of rivers present over there issue over here is related to the excessive groundwater extraction that is true but for example if you are talking about the uneven distribution of the water resources we can say that the region of kutch rajasthan as well as this interior peninsula region they have the least available quantity of the water right other regions again as per, uh, as per the geological conditions climatic conditions and all those conditions there is an uneven distribution of water resources this is true right similarly related to is is the limited availability in these particular regions there is a limited availability of water right second is monsoon dependence we all know that because of the climate change the erraticity of the monsoon is increasing even if you go by the imd report it says that despite the fact that the monsoon the quantity of the rainfall in the four months that is june july 
August and September in these four months as far as the quantity is concerned it remains within the long period average so climate change till now has not increased the erraticity of the monsoon to the extent that long period average has been distorted it remains within the deviation of plus minus 10 percent however imd also says that the regional precipitation patterns have changed the regions which earlier were having very uh, arid conditions are experiencing floods and vice versa now because the res water resources are dependent on the monsoon in india and if monsoon is becoming uh, uh, if monsoon is uh, becoming erratic so obviously we cannot depend on monsoon so this is also an important factor right reduced groundwater and the major reason for this is the agriculture that is the unscientific irrigation so because of this there is excessive extraction of the groundwater especially when you go to the uh, water rich areas for example punjab haryana uh, then uttar pradesh bihar these this northern belt typically face the issue of excessive groundwater extraction and this is also an important part that water stress when we talk about the concept of water stress it is not just related to the quantitative aspect it is also related to the qualitative aspect and because we know that because of increasing industrialization the waste water being untreated and just straight away disposed to the various water bodies so there is the issue of water contamination also so these are certain reasons certain uh, reasons which have led to the increase in water stress levels in india now come to the causes that why is it happening agricultural activities we have discussed increasing urbanization again for example concretization because of this concretization various water bodies like wetlands like lakes have been concretized and that is there is a clear case of encroachment also right so that means the surface for example there is a city and the surface which was there earlier was bare so whatever precipitation happened over there it percolated down the surface and forms the part of the groundwater but now because now this surface is being made impervious water is not able to percolate down the surface and hence there is a runoff there is a wastage of water which directly goes to the rivers and streams but yes this has led to the declining in the ground water tables getting it next is lack of treatment we discussed over here the norms related to the water treatment are not followed properly so again an issue awareness how many of us for example while uh, bathing in the morning or while uh, brushing our teeth do we really care that we have to switch off the taps when it is not in use right maybe we are uh, because we are reading these things so maybe we are educated we are aware but do you think that every person is aware about these pretty small things no so there is an issue of lack of awareness also which is leading to huge water wastages right policy issues now what are these policy issues we will be tackling this in this dimension that what are the reforms or the way ahead which is required because here we will be dealing that what suggestions can we write in the form of water governance or the policy reform so there we will talk about the issues also right as far as now is concerned what are various measures which are taken by the government of india you all are aware about these schemes just a passing by reference for example government started the pradhan mandri krishi sichai yojana which aimed at increasing the irrigational efficiencies right accelerated irrigation benefit program per drop more crop har khet ko pani so these were the components of this scheme next jal shakti abhiyan again related to the water similarly composite water management index by niti ayog was started in order to have the data related to the water management in different regions different states atal bhujal mission related to the ground water and also we know that in the manrega also various activities for example building of check dams etc are taken in order to preserve and conserve the water resources is it okay till now we have covered these dimensions right now we shall move towards the reforms and the way ahead okay so in answer uh, you can write direct points also 
बट बिकॉज वेन वी टॉक अबाउट दी वॉटर इश्यूज इन इंडिया सो एग्रीकल्चर इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट कॉम्पोनेंट दैट इज अनसाइंटिफिक एग्रीकल्चर रिलेटेड इरीगेशन और क्रॉपिंग पैटर्न सेक्टर दिस इज ऑल्सो एन अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फैक्टर वेन इट कम्स टू दी वॉटर स्ट्रेस एंड देर फोर आई हैव डिवाइडेड आई हैव कंपार्टमेंटलाइज इन टू टू डिफरेंट सेक्शन वन इज दी जनरल पॉइंट सेकेंड इज स्पेसिफिकली टू दी एग्रीकल्चर राइट इट इज ऑल्सो सेट दैट अंटिल एंड लेस वी आर नॉट गोइंग टू रिफॉर्म आर एग्रीकल्चर प्रैक्टिस वी विल नॉट फाइंड एनी लॉन्ग टर्म सोल्यूशन टू कंजर्व आर वॉटर रिसोर्सेज so that is how intricately this agriculture and water are related right first what can we do again this you can write as the policy measures this you can also write in the form of water governance right so the first important point is may having a buffer stock of water in reservoirs especially during the monsoon period so similarly what we do for the agricultural produce why do we do it because there might be a difficult time when domestically we uh, we will be having less number of agricultural produce so that is why government has a buffer stock so has so to ensure a continuous supply of those things similarly experts say that buffer stock of water should also be there in the reservoirs especially during the monsoon period when these reservoirs experience very high amount of precipitation right second is says that measuring the productivity per unit water now this is very important let us understand this what do we understand by agricultural productivity agricultural productivity in a very simple common man's language agricultural productivity is the total production from a unit area of land right right so for example 100 tons of let's say rice is produced from the area let's say of 10 hectares so the productivity will be divided and a uh, productivity will be productivity will be 10 units right basically how much production are we getting how much agriculture produce are we getting from the unit area now don't you think that we need to change our perspective in defining this why as far as this definition is concerned and if we restrain ourselves to this definition no other factor is taken care of that means in order to boost the productivity what will will be doing we will be extracting we will be continuously supplying the water we will continuously supplying the fertilizers we will be extracting the ground water also why because the measurement is just uh, drawn on the basis that from how much land how much produce is being uh, produced right but expert says that if we take the water also into account that is not just from how much land the produced has been there but also how much water is used so this change of perspective in defining the agriculture productivity check taking per unit water consumption also into account will have a drastic impact but the issue is that this is very difficult to implement right it will require a huge political courage because then the productivity levels for example in today's article it was said that let's say punjab is one of those states in india which has the highest agriculture productivity when we measure agriculture productivity with reference to the area of land only as soon as we introduce the component of water we also know that northwestern region especially punjab haryana and western up also face one of the gravest water crises unscientific irrigation excessive use of fertilizers and therefore the ground water table is ex is going is depleting at a very fast rate as soon as we introduce the uh, point of water that means their productivity of punjab will go down so what will government tell its uh, people that why productivity is getting down so there is a challenge but yes we can write it as a important way ahead introducing a concept of water credit similar in a similar fashion to the carbon credit in order to basically incentivize the private players right so basically what we are doing is we are economizing this water as of now water is freely available we want to make water credits in similar fashion to the carbon credits next is the water footprint estimation guidelines that which industry which crop which region is having a higher water footprint can it be reduced so how to measure it what should be the guidelines this is the thing participatory aquifer management now experts have said that 
decentralized approach is the only solution when it comes to the management of natural resources especially the resources like water and soil right so that is why participatory management must be there involving local panchayats involving local civil society organizations students as well as important local stakeholders right recharging of ground water as well as reviving of paleo channels paleo channels basically are the remnants of the rivers which once upon a time were flowing right so there was a time when river was flowing but now that area is dry so it is a paleo channel okay similarly coming to the agricultural solutions obviously we need to invest in modern farming practices for example organic farming for example zero tillage right and other such practices for example similarly changes in the cropping patterns now which crop should be popularized in a particular area which crop should be incentivized by the government in a particular region that has to be scientifically decided not just taking the socio economic concerns socio economic concerns should be there but scientific consideration must also be given so if in a particular region crops need to be grown or the cropping pattern need to be adopted on the basis of agro geo climatic conditions what do we mean by agro geo climatic conditions that is the agriculture being done taking into two important considerations into account one is the geo that is which type of soil is present over there second is climate what is the climate grown what is the climate available over there are you getting it next is the irrigation reforms so obviously we need to stress on micro irrigation practices for example drip and sprinkler irrigation so we need to focus on these things so these are certain reforms or the way ahead which you can write in your answers as it is and will help to manage and conserve the water resources right so the in this this was a pretty lengthy topic in this topic we have discussed that what do we understand by water stress what are the conditions responsible for water stress in india what are the immediate causes which is leading to water stress in india then we discuss what are various measures taken in this regard by the government already and in the last we discuss what can be a way ahead what solutions can you give on your own if upsc asks you in the mains paper right so this was the topic now let us move towards our last topic from the general studies mains paper 3 perspective specifically of disaster management and this topic has a immediate context of the glacial lake bursts that is clough glacial lake outburst floods which recently hit the state of sikkim and several people have died over there in sikkim there is a lake known as south lohnak lake so if you see this particular map you will see that in the northwestern part of sikkim we are having a lohnak lake that is the south lohnak lake now how the disaster increases its intensity just have a look on this particular map in the northwestern part of sikkim this particular region we have a lake so there was an intense rainfall because of which this lake outburst so glacial lake outburst flood started the water of this lake moved down and it entered into the downstream areas of lohnak river which eventually combined with the tista river which was flowing so it increased the water levels in tista again causing floods in tista and the nearby areas so there was a dam also which was known as the chungthang dam as the up water in the upstream areas increased so obviously the gates of this dam has to be opened up that is why further leading to the floods in the downstream areas of this state right this dam also suffered huge losses so dam failure also was there right and that is how this disaster unfolded in the state of sikkim in this regard we should be aware what is the basic concept of glof what is glof what are the factors which are responsible for causing glof and are there any ndma guidelines which can help to reduce the disaster risk associated with it or not in this immediate context 
ISRO has provided a map which shows the important regions which are particularly vulnerable to glacial lake outburst floods. However, applying your common sense also, you can come up with the regions that obviously the Himalayan region will be most vulnerable to the glacial lake outburst floods. So, this is the region, right? Okay. Now, let us see if you see this particular map also, just a comparative analysis, a satellite image. Here we are having the South Lonak Lake. Now, this is the South Lonak Lake. After the disaster, it has shrunk to this area. You, can you see the drastic shrink in the area? So, this is after the glacial lake outburst flood because all the water has moved downstream. In this very line, let us discuss the important key concepts or the important dimensions associated with the glacial lake outburst flood. First, what is the concept? Basically, glacial lake is a lake which is formed from glacier, maybe because of water retreat. Right? So, let us say earlier there was a glacier. Let us assume that this is a glacier and it was reaching up to this extent because of climate change, because of global warming, or because of the seasonal changes. This glacier retreated. If it is being retreated, it automatically means that the ice which was in this region will start melting. Right? If the ice in this region is starting melting and somehow if it is getting impounded at that particular area, so there can be a formation of lake, the lake which is formed out of the melted water of the glacier. This is a glacial lake. As soon as the natural boundaries of these lakes get destroyed, it becomes the outburst, it becomes the outburst flood, right? So, there can be uh, three mainly types of the glacial lakes. Uh, these lakes can be formed, let's say, above these ice levels, above the glacier. If it is formed above the glacier, it is known as the supra glacial lake. They can be formed in the front of the lake. For example, in this diagram, this was the lake and lake we made over here, that is in the front. These are known as the proglacial lake. Similarly, the lakes which are formed below the ice levels because of the uh, subsurface melting, there are subglacial lakes, right? Just in geographical terms, supra lake, pro, uh, proglacial lake and the subglacial lake. Important from the GS perspective is what are various causes responsible for this, right? One is the cloud burst. So, obviously, again, let us imagine that this is the glacial lake on the, let's say, mountainous areas, right? And there is a cloud burst that is very high intensity rainfall. So, obviously, the water level in this lake will increase. These barriers will be destroyed and water will move down. So, that is how the cloud burst affects this. Next is the snow avalanche. Again, in the higher reaches, there might be an avalanche which will come and because of its huge momentum, it will destroy these barriers and hence the water will flow out. Similarly, the landslides can also destroy this barrier. Similarly, the earthquake that is shaking of the ground will destroy this barrier and the water will move out. And excessive ice melting in the upstream areas, that is glacial melt in the upstream areas, will increase the water level and that hydrostatic pressure will be introduced and hence these barriers will be destroyed, moving the water out. So, these are certain natural factors because of which we can experience glacial lake outburst floods, right? What are various impacts? One, we have discussed the downstream floods, right? Obviously, landslide can be a cause of GLOF. Landslide can also be an impact outcome of GLOF. For example, if excessive amount of water is flowing out of this glacial lake, then obviously it is going to loosen the shear resistance, shear strength in the rock particles of, on, this rock, uh, on this mountainous slope, because of which there can be a landslide, there can be a mud flow also, which eventually can lead to losses in infrastructure that is roads, hotels, dams, etc. For example, we all are aware about the 2013 strategy which unfolded in the state of Uttarakhand, right? Because uh, where the glacial lake outburst flood in the upstream areas created a havoc in the downstream areas, 2013 floods, 
केदारनाथ वैली वॉज दी मोस्ट अफेक्टेड वन राइट देन ऑब्वियसली इट कैन ऑल्सो लीड टू दी फोर्स डिसप्लेसमेंट नाउ कमिंग टू दी गाइडलाइंस विच आर इशूड बाय नेशनल डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट अथॉरिटी दैट इज एन डी एम ए इन ऑर्डर टू रिड्यूस द डिजास्टर रिस्क एसोसिएटेड विद ग्लॉफ वन आइडेंटिफिकेशन ऑफ द पोटेंशियल लेक द लेक्स विच आर शोइंग अस द साइन ऑफ ब्रीच द साइन ऑफ डिस्ट्रक्शन दोज लेक्स शुड बी आइडेंटिफाइड सो दैट द मेजर्स कैन बी टेकन टू प्रोटेक्ट दैम सेकेंड इज द रियल टाइम असेसमेंट using the satellite using various mapping techniques there should be a real time assessment regarding the water levels for example with the coming of monsoon with changes in season the water levels will also be changing so water levels not just in rivers they also change in the lakes so there should be a real time assessment so that we can adopt some strategy we can take some steps before the disaster taking place then is the channeling of floods let us assume that we cannot prevent glof but if the glof happens we can make certain tunnels we can make certain channels through which this excessive water will go so that it does not affect the habitation the habitants living over that particular area these channels can be made from those regions which are less densely populated right then is the multi hazard early warning system now as we have discussed here that landslide can Uh, for example there was a cloud burst intense rainfall one disaster cloud burst second disaster led to glacial lake outburst flood third disaster which in turn led to river flooding fourth disaster which in turn led to landslides and mud flow fifth disaster so are you connecting that the disasters will be having the cascading effect and that is why because there are multiple disasters the early warning system must also be designed taking multi hazards into account multiple hazards into account right then is the training of local manpower it has been witnessed that the local population which lives in these those areas they have certain traditional knowledge also which can be very handy when the disaster strike those areas also their training is important that when a disaster strikes which are those for example the first aid training right So the modern first aid training must be given to the local population so that if the disaster strikes, there should be some steps through which they can save lives. Similarly, building codes also become important because in the mountainous areas, it has been witnessed that the building bylaws, the construction codes are not fully implemented, and because of the uh, irrational increase in tourism in those areas, there is a uh the uh, the hotels the restaurants the road infrastructure etc they are just mushrooming and which is increasing the load overall load in the mountainous ecosystems and therefore a proper building codes must be designed and more importantly must be followed right so these are the important uh, uh guidelines given by the ndma right again this was topic from the mains perspective so here we have discussed the concept of glof the causes of glof the impacts of glof as well as the disaster risk reduction guidelines given by ndma right so this was all for today if you people have any doubt you can ask i will be taking up the comments if you have any doubt related to these topics you can ask so uh, as far as the session is concerned it is over right if you have any questions any doubts you can ask the pdfs will be provided to you they will uh, you can access them through the telegram channel also they will be uploaded on the youtube channel also pdf as well as word file right any doubts related to glof related to water conservation any concept so you can ask
Yes, Balaji, all the important content will be available in the PDF. And in the PDF, you will be getting more content than we have, what we have discussed. So don't worry about it, right? Everything will be there in the PDF. Right? Anmol, yes, uh, all the natural disasters will be covered, but only when it will be there in newspaper. So obviously only then we will be covering it, right? So we'll be covering it from the multiple dimension. 